Good morning, good morning. How are you guys doing? Welcome to Tuesday Training. That's right, it's Tuesday, which means 9 a.m. Here we are for Tuesday Training, live from Austin, Texas, here in the Insurance Syndicate. Syndicate, you can see that dude behind me back there. Oh, buddy, Joe Camper. Hope everybody is having a fantastic Tuesday. It's Thanksgiving week. What a wonderful week. The temperatures are here. They're cool in Austin, Texas today, man. It is a little uh, nipply, as they might say. Uh, and I've got a pretty good little show lined up for you guys. It's going to be kind of lighthearted. We got some news. We got some stuff to talk about and a little bit of storytelling. Uh, and first, I wanted to lead off with um, a little bit of gratitude, man. I hope you guys caught yesterday's Monday Mindset with Luke Akery. If you did, put it in the comments below. Man, it was a great show talking about gratitude and how important gratitude is in our life and why we should start every day with gratitude. I definitely believe that. And it got me to thinking about things that I and grateful for in my life. And I certainly have a lot of things to be grateful for. Uh, anything from my house to my dogs to my opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing always wraps above. And I was thinking about it pretty hard. And for a long time, you know, if you're a if you're a man out there and you're married, a lot of times you think that uh that you're the leader in the family. You're the leader and the couple, right? You're the man, you're the wearing the pants, you're the one making the decisions, et cetera, et cetera. But the truth is, uh, I am extremely grateful for Grace being the leader in our family. And I remember the day I kind of woke up and realized, like, man, she's the one running the show. It ain't me. I'm not the big talker. I'm not the big pants. I'm not the pants wearing guy making all the decisions, running the show. She runs the show, truthfully. And I'm extremely grateful for that. Uh, she's a phenomenal leader in our business. She's a phenomenal leader in our relationship. Uh, and she outworks everybody in this office, 100%. No offense to the guys over there uh, at Redwood, but uh, she outworks everybody. She is here bell to bell, uh, and I am just super, super grateful for that and appreciate it. So thank you. Uh, love you very much, Grace. Uh, moving along, though, I uh, want to jump into some news, but I did want to take a moment you know, to give a shout out to our sponsor, MetaZeus. Thank you, MetaZeus, for number one, sponsoring the show. I'm grateful for you guys as well. And I'm grateful for your software, man. You've been making me money and helping me retain business. I truly appreciate it. Uh, I use this software pretty close to daily. About every two days, I'm taking my book of business and I'm uh, scanning it through MetaZeus. It's incredibly easy to use. You just click a button, hit uh, fetch data is, is the, the button that you hit, but it basically refreshes your screen takes all of your data and it's bouncing your book off of the CMS uh, information uh, and then sends it back to you. And it will tell you as long as you have two pieces of information, you just need the Medicare number and uh, date of birth. As long as you have those two items, it will ping CMS. It will tell you what plan they're currently enrolled in. And it will tell you if they have a future plan. In other words, if they've made a change to start January, it'll tell you if they've made a change. And with that information, you can then go behind and work on some retention stuff. And we've saved a handful of apps already. Uh, we've also discovered people that we didn't know were qualifying for various levels of LIS already or Medicaid even. And we've been able to go back and get them even more benefits uh, than they were already getting. And they are super appreciative. So it is a fantastic tool. Um, I highly recommend anybody at minimum get a demo of it. Find out how it works and get signed up, man. It's only 89 bucks a month. That's basically three Medicare Advantage applications a year. I've already saved about five or six uh, just to, during this AEP. Uh, so we've definitely gotten our money's worth out of it. Kick-ass tool. Definitely check it out. Hit up Evan McGuffey if you want some more information on it. We've got info in the group. Uh, but get a demo. Check it out. Get your book of business uploaded. Start monitoring it in real time. Because if you don't, then when you have an app that gets flipped or replaced, you're not going to find out for two or three months most of the time. And then you've got to charge back and then it's too late to do anything about it until next season. So great tool. Uh, super happy. And thank you for sponsoring this show again, MetaZeus. And uh, with all of that said, it's time for my favorite clip. Let's go with some news. Who's ready for some news? And you guys know how I do it. I like to talk about fraud and we definitely got some fraud today check this one out uh, office of public affairs this comes straight from the u.s department of justice uh, great little website you can find all kinds of cool stuff here uh, 
And then one of the things that I'm always looking for is press releases related to fraud in the Medicare space, because one thing that we always hear about how Medicare's trust fund is being depleted and how Medicare is overspending and so forth. And, and the Medicare is not going to be around much longer because it's getting depleted. Well, this is a big reason why uh, the Medicare fund is being drained. And it's because of these fraudulent people that are out there stealing from it. And right here, as the headline says, we have a chief compliance officer sentenced for $50 million in Medicare fraud. And it cracks me up because that statement in and of itself is ironic. The chief compliance officer, the one that is supposed to be following the rules, the one that is supposed to be tip top in regards to the ins and outs of Medicare and making sure that they're following everything. And here we find out uh, that they are being sentenced for $50 million in fraud. And if we read along, it'll tell us that a Florida man was sentenced today to four years and six months in prison and ordered to pay $21.7 million in restitution for his role in a healthcare fraud and wire fraud conspiracy that resulted in over $50 million in false and fraudulent claims being submitted to Medicare. You know, if he defrauded him for 50 million, how come he only has to pay back 21 million? Shouldn't he have to pay back the whole thing? But it says, according to court documents and evidence presented at trial, Stephen King, age 45 of Miramar, I guess novels aren't working out so much lately for him, so he has to uh, defraud Medicare instead. But Stephen King, age 45, of Miramar, was the chief compliance officer for a pharmacy holding company that fraudulently billed Medicare for dispensing lidocaine and diabetic testing supplies that Medicare beneficiaries did not need or want. This isn't the first guy or the first pharmacy group that's been doing this. Uh, there are quite a few, uh, and, and it really got kicked up, ramped up during the COVID times when things were getting mailed out to people more often. Uh COVID uh, screening tests, diabetic supplies, uh, mail order for pharmacy items really went up during the COVID times. And it started giving all these guys opportunities to fraudulently start sending stuff out. And this guy is now sending out lidocaine and diabetic testing supplies, billing Medicare for it. But these people, number one, they don't need the supplies and they're not asking for the supplies, but he's sending them out because they're free because they're not having to pay for them at all, the, the beneficiaries. Medicare's picking up the whole tab on that, and he's nailing them. So uh, I'm with it, man. Let's, you know, I hate to see people go to prison, but shoot, man, if you're going to pill for my business, really, which is what he's doing, when you think about it, I'm in the Medicare space. So he's out here pilfering my business for the tune of $50 million, uh, creating problems ultimately in Medicare and problems in the longevity of what I'm doing as an agent. Yeah, I say it, lock the dude up throw away the key even four years and six months. Maybe that's not long enough, but got to, got to find a way to get rid of this fraud that's out there. So moving along in that same kind of space, here we go with another one. Not so much fraud, but it's, it's kind of fraud. Um, United healthcare faces a class action lawsuit over algorithmic care denials in Medicare Advantage plan. So this is something that people have been talking about for a bit. Obviously, uh, algorithms and AI has really taken hold in healthcare in a lot of ways. And one of those ways is certainly through getting, uh, getting certain treatments approved, getting prior authorization done, things of that nature. And here we have a class action lawsuit filed against United Health Group. If you're not already aware, United Health Group is the 500 pound gorilla in the Medicare space. They are the number one insurer of probably everybody, but definitely senior citizens or Medicare beneficiaries. They do more business than the top three next carriers combined. Aetna, Humana, Blue Cross are the next three. United Healthcare does more business than those three carriers combined. Uh, so it's to see them getting in trouble is is uh, it's a little alarming to me, I guess, because they should be the, definitely the ones doing it right. But it says here that a class action lawsuit was filed Tuesday against United Health Group and a subsidiary alleging that they are illegally using an algorithm to deny rehabilitation care to seriously ill patients, even though the companies know that the algorithm has a high error rate. So they're claiming that United Healthcare already knows that this algorithm that they're using to approve or deny rehabilitative care uh, has a high error rate. And if they know that, but they're still letting it run, they're saying that's an illegal practice pretty simply. 
And it says that internal documents revealed that managers within the company set a goal for clinical employees to keep patient rehab stays within 1% of the days projected by the algorithm. Uh, but the fraudulent scheme affords defendants a clear financial windfall in the form of policy premiums without having to pay for promised care. So pretty simple here. Uh, the elderly are prematurely kicked out of care facilities nationwide or forced to deplete family savings to continue receiving necessary care, all because an artificial intelligence model disagrees with the real life doctor's recommendation. So it's a pretty simple tool that they use to guide and help inform providers, families, uh, and other caregivers about what sort of assistance and care the patient may need, both in the facility and after returning home. Coverage decisions are based on CMS coverage criteria and the term of the member's plan. The company added that the lawsuit has no merit and we will defend ourselves vigorously. So uh, they're not complaining about it, but certainly uh, other people are. There is a large class action lawsuit against them. And that lawsuit further alleges that United Healthcare knew that the algorithm had an extremely high error rate and that it denied patients claims knowing that only a tiny percentage, 0.2%, would file appeals to try to overturn it. The complaint alleges the algorithm dubbed NH predict has a 90% error rate, basing that calculation on the percentage of payment denials revised or reversed through internal appeals. So pretty, pretty blatant inaccuracy if it's really 90%. So that, that's pretty nasty there. We're seeing them uh, go up through a uh, class action lawsuit. And here it even gives us an example the plaintiffs leading the class action lawsuit are the families of two deceased Wisconsin residents, both of whom had Medicare Advantage coverage through United Health. In May of 2022, Gene Locken, age 91, fractured his leg and ankle and stayed in a nursing home for a month with no physical therapy to allow his injuries to heal. After his doctor then approved Locken to start physical therapy, United Health and NavaHealth paid for only 19 days of therapy in the nursing home before uh, saying Lockin was safe to go home, according to the lawsuit. Now, I see some possibilities for, I'm just going to call it bullshit uh, in here right up front. So number one, he's not in a nursing home. They're going to call it a nursing home. It's really a skilled nursing facility. Medicare Advantage plans will give you 20 days in a skilled nursing facility at zero cost. All Medicare Advantage plans have that benefit built in. Why? Because they have to cover at least what Medicare covers. And Medicare gives you 20 days in skilled nursing for free. After 20 days, you got to start paying. So that's really what seems like is happening here is this guy was in the nursing home or in skilled nursing for 19 days recovering after he had fractured his legs and ankle. That's pretty standard procedure, right? If someone gets hurt, they have a major surgery, they break a leg, break an ankle, they have a knee replacement, a major back surgery, hip replacement, etc. After they're done in the hospital, getting uh, that leg reset or having that, uh, that joint replaced, they're immediately moved to skilled nursing, immediately, so that their rehab can teach them how to walk on that leg again, teach them how to stand up again, how to transfer themselves. And they get 20 days of that for free. After 20 days, they, uh, they would have to start paying a co-payment for time in that skilled nursing facility unless they had something like a home health care plan. Uh, speaking of, there are some outstanding home health care plans out there if you're looking for one. Um, if they don't have home health care, then they're going to be paying about 204 bucks for every day that they're in skilled nursing. So it looks like this guy ran right up against 19 days. And then now doctors and therapists are appealing the denials because they did uh, United Healthcare did not want to keep him in skilled nursing after 20 days. Same thing happened with the next person. Dale Tetzloff, age 74, suffered a stroke in October 22, and his doctor immediately recommended long-term care in a nursing home. Now, long-term care is not covered by Medicare. Long-term care is not covered by Medicare Advantage plans. So whoever's writing this article is bending some of the vernacular a little bit, because again, they're saying that he's getting long-term care in a nursing home. He is not getting long-term care in a nursing home. He is in a skilled nursing facility. It looks a lot like long-term care, but it's not, right? He is in a skilled nursing facility going through rehab and therapy to learn how to, how to you know, depending on the nature of a stroke, could be speech therapy, could be learning to stand and walk again or function some of his limbs. Um so again, same thing, United Health and Navahealth cut off his care after 20 days. 
the lawsuit says. Uh, and that is right at the cusp where you don't get any more free time in the nurse, in skilled nursing. You got to start paying. So I'm guessing they either A, he didn't have the copayment for 204 bucks, and they knew that. Uh, or it could be like, hey, no, we need to get this dude out of here uh, after 20 days and get him rolling. So not sure this is 100% perfect uh, in the way this article is written or in the way this claim is made against United Healthcare. Uh, but this is definitely a story I want to stay on top of and kind of read some more. So I'll keep you guys updated. I'll throw this in the group if you want to check it out and read some more. But uh, it looks like really what's going on is these people are just running through their free time that they get for skilled nursing. And then they're getting moved out after that, which I can't say that that's not necessarily pretty standard. So is what it is. Moving along, we got some more Medicare news for you guys. Uh, this one is from Humana, or not from Humana, but this is out of Health Payer Intelligence, and it says that Humana's value-based care plans are have improved health outcomes for MA members. Now, if you guys aren't familiar with what value-based care is, uh, value-based care is a clinical model that really provides a person pretty much all-in-one care in a single facility group of doctors, right? It's, it's a network, but they're all generally in one building or in a couple of buildings around town. You may have heard of Oak Street. They are one of the largest value-based care providers out there. You've got numerous more, WellMed, for example, Suvita, and the Latin Space is a group that we partner with to do value-based care. But what it allows, it allows a beneficiary to get their preventive care, their primary care, their chronic care, their acute care, all in one facility without having to go see this guy over here and go see that guy over there and that guy over there. And the whole idea is that it will be able to better coordinate care among these doctors for a single patient to improve their health outcomes. And this article here is saying, hey, it's working, you know, at least uh, in regards to Humana's value-based care model, that it is working. So it says that in addition to proving health outcomes, Humana's Medicare Advantage value-based care plans generate $8 billion in cost savings for 2022. Humanic Medicare beneficiaries receiving care under value-based arrangements had better health outcomes, including fewer inpatient admissions and emergency room visits. And that's the whole idea behind value-based care. What they want to do is they want to be able to catch these people and they're trying to, eh, assuming that, it, that everything is on the up and up, right? We'll just give everybody the benefit of the doubt um, and say it's on the up and up. The whole idea is to change the model of healthcare, right? We already know that right now healthcare is, is a wreck. And a big part of why it's a wreck is because healthcare is focused on treating disease versus preventing disease, right? Every time we go to the doctor, every time we go to the hospital or something, all they do is they give us medications and they treat the ailment that we have. They don't cure it and they don't work to prevent it. Value-based care is, is a model that is looking to change that or at least that's the claim that it makes, right? That by having a more coordinated system, doctors can catch things early. You get rewarded for preventative care treatments, right? Is the way a lot of these value-based uh, care plans are designed is that when you take time to work on preventative treatments, uh, you will actually get rewarded as a patient in a lot of ways, uh, whether it be maybe through your flex card or through different uh, incentives and rewards that you might get. So it goes on to say that 70% of individual Medicare Advantage plan members were aligned with the value-based care provider. The rate of preventative screenings for these beneficiaries was between 3 and 11% higher than the rate for those not under value-based care arrangements. For screenings that require cost or require care coordination across providers, the rate was between 8 and 11% higher for those that were in a value-based arrangement says that Medicare beneficiaries receiving value-based care are also more likely to adhere to their medications for conditions like diabetes and hypertension. So it goes on with some more statistics, but I thought it was mainly just interesting that that uh, that we're seeing proof that this value-based care model is working. There's a lot of people that argue against it. Um, I believe in it. I think this is definitely the future of healthcare, and I've talked about this in the past. I actually did a whole uh, presentation on it at Medicare Con last year, did it in the uh, National Association of Health Underwriters, a couple of their locations, where I basically talk about what's happening in healthcare in regards to what our beneficiaries are going to look like 
health wise in the next seven to 10 years and how our treatments are going to have to or how our care models are going to have to adjust. And then ultimately insurance is going to have to adjust around that. Um, and I believe that value based care is definitely where we're headed. So it goes on to say that uh, this is pretty interesting here that compared to traditional Medicare, value based care beneficiaries had 30 percent fewer inpatient admissions saving 214,000 admissions in 2022 compared to non-value based care medicare advantage beneficiaries they were set there were 7.1% fewer admissions so it is definitely helping keep people out of the hospital uh, through uh, good preventative and chronic care treatment so kudos to value based care i'm a big proponent of it uh, and if you're not out there familiar with it, I would get familiar with it. You know, find a local value-based care clinic that's in your area. Go give it a visit. Check it out. Talk to some of the people that are there and find out maybe what plans they accept. Uh, in a lot of cases, you can develop a good relationship with some of these value-based care providers. They'll refer people to you. We get the occasional referral from Savita, from people that want to use the Savita clinic but need a better Medicare plan so they can go over there. Uh, so definitely, again, uh, get into that value-based care stuff. But uh, moving along, man, this is a hot one here. <sighs> this is a hot one. And, and again, it's we're, so we're sticking with the Medicare theme today, if you guys haven't figured that out, but that's me. I'm a Medicare guy. I believe in long obedience, one simple direction. So keeping it moving along, this is a regard, regards to the Part D drugs. And I posted this in the group yesterday, uh, but it basically says that Medicare Part D 2024 drug premiums soar in advance of lower inflation uh, reduction act capped cap on catastrophic drug cost. So I'm going to summarize this for you for the most part. But if you don't already know, uh, just a couple of years ago or so, the Inflation Reduction Act was passed, which part of that giant bill was to create caps on different catastrophic drugs. One was certainly the insulin caps that we're seeing. So for anybody that has a Medicare Advantage plan or any kind of Medicare Part D coverage, I should say, uh, if they're taking insulin and it's covered by formulary, that's capped at $35. An amazing benefit for diabetics. I, when, I, when, I, when I heard about that and I saw uh, the changes that were being made, I cheered for that because I know for a fact that there are Medicare beneficiaries out there that are diabetic and they are rationing their insulin because they can't afford to, to refill it because it's so damn expensive. So then the Inflation Reduction Act comes along and puts a cap on it to help them out. Uh, there's more that goes beyond that. And I'm not going to go through this whole article, but the Inflation Reduction Act also gives opportunity. And I've talked about this in the past for Medicare to now negotiate drugs for some of these uh, with, with Big Pharma, negotiate the top 100 prescriptions that are out there so they can try to get a better rate so that they can pass that better rate to the consumers. So in the world of Part D, Medicare, right, that's your drug coverage. If you're on a standalone Part D plan, right, so a lot of the folks that are out there, a lot of my clients, they have a Medicare supplement plan, which covers their, their medical and their hospital uh, gaps within Medicare, and then they'll buy a standalone drug plan that they can use to go to Walgreens or CVS or Walmart, Costco, whatever, and get their drugs refilled. Well. Those plans come with the premium, number one, right? There's a there's a premium to get to, to buy the plan and get enrolled in it. And then number two, there's a cost every time they go and refill their drugs. Now, there are some drugs that are $0 for some of your real low-cost generics, like maybe Losartan or Sinopril, some of those things. And then obviously, the higher-end drugs are going to have a higher copayment stuff, like Eliquis, right, which is really hard to get covered. They're going to have to pay more for those. So when you compare those costs, they, they, they're kind of like a teeter-totter, right? If the, if the drug plan is going to give you a drug like a high-cost insulin, Humalog or whatever it might be for only $35, they're going to have to make up the difference on the premium side. So for a long time, a lot of these the premiums on the drug plans were very low, $5, $7. Now we've got a zero-cost drug plan that's out there. And, and and I'm a little leery of it because I feel like just like Justin Brock said uh, in one of his posts that this is probably a data grab for WellCare going after the this zero dollar uh, drug plan. But if we're going to give them a zero dollar drug plan and we're going to give them a really low cost on their drug, something's going to have to give. And this is definitely true. One of my clients was recently paying twenty four dollars a month 
for his drug plan. And it was covering his drugs just fine. He had he got prescribed a couple more drugs, so he had to relook at his plan. And now, in order to get him a good price on his refills, where he can actually afford to go refill his drugs at the pharmacy, he had to enroll in a plan that's $108 premium. $108, that's a really tall premium on a drug plan that's out there. Uh, but when you look at the math, that's the plan that gives them the best cost annually, including premiums and refilled costs. So that's what this article is really talking about here. It's, it's just basically saying that, look, because the Inflation Reduction Act put caps on all of these drug costs so that the carriers that are selling drug plans are now having, they're earning less or they're able to, uh, they're, you know, because they're still having to buy that drug at the pharmacy or or their their uh, their pharmaceutical provider. I can't think of the, the PBM. Right. They're still having to spend a, a fixed dollar price there. So if they're not able to retrieve or recuperate some of that cost through the refills, then something's going to have to change. And that means premiums are going up and we are seeing premiums go up. Right. It says on average, 42 to 57 percent more in 2024 compared to 2023. Right. So we're seeing plans that are 40 to 60 percent higher in premium, and it's going to get likely even worse next year. So pretty blatant right here. It just says significantly more expensive premiums will come as a shock to the millions of retirees enrolled in Medicare Part D plans who, along with CMS, may have been anticipating lower cost. And a lot of us were like we all thought, man, inflation reduction at great. It's going to bring down the drug cost. No, it's just going to drive up premiums. So it, it's just flip flopping is what's happening in the drug world. We're not we're we're getting a lower cost on our refills, but we're having to make we're having to pay more in premium dollars to get those low costs. Fairly simple. And we got one more last one. This one's another good one. I like I shared this in the group yesterday as well. And you may remember last week I talked about this a little bit, not this specific article, but I talked about a group called Maximus Federal Services. You may remember last week we talked about uh, their workforce going on strike, and it was about seven to eight hundred uh, ACA and Medicare call center agents that work for Maximus Federal all went on strike. They 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 want more money, they want fair pay, better wages, blah blah blah, right? So they all went on strike, and then here a week later, Maximus has a potential data breach. As a result, CMS and, and Maximus Federal Services are sending letters to 330,000 current people with Medicare who may have been impacted. So big breach of data services through Maximus. I don't know if it's related to the walkout. I mean, doesn't take a lot to kind of draw that conclusion, though, right? You maybe got some disgruntled employees. They're not happy with the way uh, Maximus is taking care of them as employees. They're not giving them the right benefits, not giving them the right hours, not giving them good pay in their in their belief. So they all walk out. And then who knows? A couple of them maybe have the passwords, have the codes, have the logins. And then, boom, they let something out and they, and they make a big data breach. I don't, I don't know if that's connected, but it does seem a bit bizarre uh, that – Two times in, in a week, not only do they get a walkout of their uh, employees, but then all of a sudden they have a big data breach. And I and I posted about this not only in the group, but I posted this on my personal page and kind of made an alert to some of the Medicare beneficiaries that are out there that follow me. Uh, those that are not only my clients, but those that just follow my page. And I was like, you know, if you're a Medicare beneficiary, like who are you getting your service from? Who are you trusting as your agent with your health to help you with your health care choices? Are you working with a large call center like this that has a disregard for their employees, probably, that has apparently a disregard for your data? Not to mention, I mean, do they actually even give a rat's ass about your health care choices, truthfully, when it comes down to it? Is this the kind of groups that you're trusting with your health care decisions? Or are you working with your local trusted agent, right? And as agents out there, I know what the answer is for all of us. But, you know, this is, to me, this is a pretty big deal. And, I, and this is something that if I'm an agent and I'm talking to clients, um, this is stuff that I'm probably in, informing them of and go, Hey, just want to give you a heads up. You know, I'm a local agent and I really appreciate your business. Unfortunately, I can't stop the phone calls from all of these large call centers that are out there that are coming after your business. And just so you understand who they are and what you're up against, like these are large contractors that have hundreds of thousands of employees in their group. 
and they completely disregard certain things like, you know, the, are these the type of people you want helping you with your healthcare decisions or you want to keep working with me? So uh, pretty simple stuff. Think about that a little bit. And that is pretty much it for the news. Thank you all so much for that. And I wanted to talk about one other little thing. This is going to be kind of a short little show here, I guess. But I wanted to talk about something that happened to, again, Grace, uh, my wife. As For those of you that know my wife, you follow her on Facebook or YouTube or anywhere on social media, you know she works her tail off. And you know she's a little newer to the industry. This is her third year, just finished her third year in August. This is her fourth AEP. And it's not a big deal. Some people think this is, oh my goodness, extravagant, but it's not a big deal. What I'm about to explain is fairly standard practice to some extent, right? So she was recently terminated by an insurance company, not for cause. She didn't do anything illegal. She didn't do anything fraudulent. She simply was writing nothing but guarantee issue business. And when I say guarantee issue, I don't mean guarantee issue through like loss of coverage or through some other uh, dire means where someone uh, who is definitely sick or ill, she's able to slide in through a guarantee issue rule. Our business model focuses on people that are turning 65, right? We specifically go after people that are brand new to Medicare, never been on a Medicare Advantage plan, never been on a Medicare supplement. They are brand spanking new. They need education. They need some hand holding, and they need certainly good health care. So uh, when, when you are targeting that group, when it comes to writing them Medicare supplement policies, you don't need, uh, there's no underwriting. They get guaranteed issue. So for the first six months that someone's on Medicare, they can choose any Medicare supplement policy they want, plan A, B, C, D, F, G, whatever, right? With exception of some macro rules, don't get too tedious on me there, but they can basically pick any plan they want with no underwriting, no pre-existing condition clauses, no wait period, instant, right? Now, by state law, carriers have to follow that rule and they have to provide that six month open enrollment window and accept that business, but they don't like it. Well, you, I mean, if you're out there and you understand the world of insurance, you understand that every insurance carrier out there is playing. They're all gambling. They're playing a game of edges and a lot of and thin margins, right? They're trying to retrieve uh, premium dollars. They take those premium dollars and they invest them somewhere to make more money with them. And then they're hoping that you never have any claims, Right. And if you do have claims, then obviously they've got the money to pay them. But they're playing a little gambling game. And hopefully we can get more money in than we're putting out. And we can use those investment dollars of our premiums to earn even more money for our company so that we can grow and increase our financial rating and et cetera. And, and make sure that we're solvent for the people that do need claims. That's the first game they're playing. And that's why they have underwriting. Right. So any care. And this is true in the PNC world. Right. True in the life world. True in the health insurance world where you can't underwrite products. But that's why there's health screening that they want to verify and say, hey, uh, this is the type of business we want. This is not the type of business we want. Right. If you're a truck driver out there in the PNC world and you have a couple of marks on your driving history, I mean, you're going to have a tough time getting really good insurance. Same thing in the Medicare space. If you're someone out there that's sick uh, or have some major health conditions, like you're going to have trouble finding a Medicare supplement policy that will accept you. But. You get six months when you're 65 years old, when you're brand new to Medicare, that you cannot get denied. You can pick any plan you want. And for people that are unhealthy and do have some, some medical situations, that is a lot of times the one time that they can get it right and get the best coverage that they'll ever get. Because if they don't, after that, they probably can't pass underwriting after that first six months. So that's our target market. Not that we're trying to purposely get people in under the radar with the uh, with, with no underwriting, that's just the target market of choice for us, the people that are new to Medicare, right? And the reason why we go after that market is because they're more loyal, they need more help, and it's because they need more help that they're more loyal when you do help them out. And a lot of times they need more products. And then just to be blatant with you on the Medicare Advantage side of that things for that group, uh, we get paid more. It's more profitable, just flat out. Like that's the big reason, right? It's the biggest market out there. It also happens to me as the most profitable. So anyway... So Grace is writing all this business that's guarantee issue for people that are brand new to Medicare. And, she, and there's a couple of good carriers out there that we've been going after and utilizing for this business that we feel confident in that they're going to be around. They've got long, uh, 
they, they're the, the way they've modeled their product looks like they're going to have really good rate trends for the long haul, which means good persistency for us, right? If there's, if there's no big rate jacks. So I don't, I don't know. I think I want to say she wrote about 50 apps, right? Open enrollment with this carrier. And then she gets a letter from them that says, Hey, based on your, uh, uh, I can't think of the word now, but basically based on your quality of business, right? They basically said, hey, you know, your quality of business is not at the level that we want it. So we're terminating you. And she was baffled about it. She's like, I don't understand. I'm, what am I doing wrong? Am I doing something wrong? Why are they targeting me? I'm like, they're not targeting you. I was like, this is standard, right? All of these insurance carriers are trying to protect their claims, their book of business, right? To keep it solvent as they can. So I said, chances are, I mean, you wrote about 50 apps that are all open enrollment. There's no health qualifications on them. So all these people are immediately uh, approved with no pre-existing condu uh, condition clauses, no waiting period. I was like, you probably had a few people in your group that had some pretty significant claims. I mean, I know in my group, I had some that had some $320,000 hospital bills this year that were fully paid by their Medicare supplement plan. Uh, so she probably had some and maybe they felt like her claims history was a little upside down for the business that she's written. So they terminated her to protect that book of business. Uh, and that's pretty standard practice with some of the smaller Medicare supplement carriers that are out there. You won't see this so much with your big box brands. Like you won't see United Healthcare doing this practice. You won't see Aetna or Mutual of Omaha or some of these carriers doing this practice. But some of your smaller, lesser branded Medicare supplement products that are great products I'm talking A ratings. I'm talking good claims history. I'm talking good uh, loss ratios, right? They're they're managing that book well, and that's what you want as an agent. I mean, I've been doing Medicare for 20 years and Medicare supplements for the, the, that entire time. Um, generally, I try to shy away from the big box brands. I try not to write Aetna's and United Healthcare's and Mutual Omaha's and Blue Cross's so much, not because I don't like them, not because I have something against them, but generally, those who get them, and this, and this is not as true as it in today's market as it was 10, 15 years ago, because there's more products now than there ever has been, right? And there's fewer people that are turning 65 choosing Medicare supplement plans versus Medicare Advantage than there ever has been, right? It used to be a very easy rule in the Medicare supplement game. Whichever company got the most business in that state that year was going to have the highest rate increases. And that was a law that you could live by when you were an agent picking the different Medicare supplement carriers that you wanted to work with. You're like, okay, so here's ABC carrier. They got the cheapest rate in the state. They've got big bucket money, right? They got big box FMOs pushing their product out. They're going to eat up a huge chunk of the market share, which means they're going to get the most claims, which then means they're going to have the highest rate trends. And then you simply just avoid those carriers and you find your niche products. And, and I got really good at that for a long time. And I still feel like I'm one of the better people out there to pick the Medicare supplement products that are going to be there for the long haul. And so I tend to pick some of the smaller brands that a lot of people don't so much pay attention to. And I know that I can get good history, uh, good rate trends, and then certainly good persistency on my business because that's what it's about. Keep those people on the book so you're getting that perpetuity. So this is not a big deal, right? And that termination wasn't for cause. So she's not losing her renewal stream. She still gets all of her money for all the business she's ever written. Her clients are still taken care of. She just can't write new business with that specific carrier. So if you're an agent out there, think about this. And, and a lot of people are like, that's shitty by the insurance company. Shame on them. Shame on them. And I'm like, in my brain, because I understand the game, I'm like, no, that's good on them. And if you're an agent also writing that same company, that should actually excite you. Because now you understand, hey, that carrier is looking out for the entire block of business and they're terminating agents that they don't feel are writing the quality, the level of quality that they want them to. So they haven't terminated me with that carrier yet. So Grant, so I'm still going to be writing them myself. Grace can't write them anymore, but I can sure still write them. And I will be because I know that that company is looking out for their block of business. They're doing their best to keep the claims history tight so that they can continue keeping low rate trends, satisfied customers, right? So even as much as I'm like, man, that kind of sucks that she can't write it anymore. I can still write it and I still will. And I hope that other agents that are appointed with that carrier will continue writing it and writing good business with them because that product, I believe it's going to be here for the long haul. 
And uh, and that's pretty much it on that topic, I guess. So if you're an agent out there, right, and you're thinking about that, understand that number one, if you and, and a lot of you guys don't understand this, and it boggles my mind, but in the contract that you sign to be appointed with any insurance company, it very blatantly says that you are an agent of the insurance company. You're an agent of the company. We all like to think that we're an agent of our client. And yeah, to a big extent, we are. We have to look out for them. But we can only look out for them within the confines of our contractual obligation to that insurance company to act as an agent of the company. And what does that mean? That means the company wants you to write business that they feel is in their best interest. They want you to write business uh, a certain type of business, right? They don't want guarantee issue garbage. They don't want if you're a uh, truckers that have marks on their record, right? They don't want you sliding things through and, 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 and gaming the system, so to speak. Uh, they can, they cannot kick the client off the plan. That's one of the great things about the Medicare world and specifically Medicare supplements. They cannot single out a client. They cannot kick them off the plan. The only way that someone, uh, can have their Medicare supplement policy canceled is basically through non-payment of premium or by writing a letter with a wet signature and sending it to that company that says, hey, please cancel my insurance coverage effective, yada, yada, yada. So the agent can't cancel that policy for the client and the and the, uh, the company can't single that client out for a rate increase and they can't single them out by kicking them off the plan. So all of the people that she wrote in that book of business are all fine. They're all good. Right. They're going to continue getting great service. They're going to continue getting their claims paid and they will not see any abnormal rate increases singled out to them. Right. The entire group, the whole block of business might get a rate adjustment. But chances are, if this carrier is doing what they should be doing and protecting that book of business, then ultimately uh, that book's going to stay pretty clean overall. And those rate trends are going to stay uh, much lower. So. You know, at this point, she has to look at another carrier and say, hey, you know, what is another product that I can continue to write this level of business with and bring my client satisfaction? And thankfully, because I know how to pick products, I've already got a couple lined up for, which brings me to my last little bit of information for you. If you're an agent out there that's new to the Medicare space, listen up. <clears throat> a lot, I see a lot of agents make this mistake when they get into the Medicare space. And it's usually because they're probably talking to the wrong marketer or the wrong broker, and so forth. And, and the advice that they're being given is incorrect. I see a lot of agents, they come in the Medicare space brand new. They've got their license. They know what they want to do. They got a little bit of experience in some other product lines or markets. And they're like, boom, let's go Medicare. And then they fill out 15 contracts for a whole bunch of different insurance companies. And they plan to go out there and light up the world. <clears throat> and most of the time, you'll see agents that do that either A, get themselves overwhelmed and frustrated early or never really service any of those carers that they contracted for. So how do you pick which products to work with if you're an agent brand new to Medicare space? I'm of the opinion that if you are brand spanking new, because Medicare has a steep learning curve, you're going to be drinking from a fire hose for a little while. You should not pick up more than five contracts as your first go as a Medicare agent. That's the absolute maximum, in my opinion that you should start with on day one. You can grow them later. You can always get more, but there's no reason for you to go out there and try to pick up every single product that's in your uh, geographical target area just because some marketer says, oh, well, you're going to need this and you're going to need this and you're going to need that, that to cover that. And you need this one for that. And you're going to need this product and this product. No, 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 no. You need about five good carriers. You need the core products. And I don't care which state if you're in, if you're in Washington or Florida or any of the states in between, the first one that you have to have is United Healthcare because United Healthcare has a national footprint. They're endorsed by AARP and they are the 500 pound gorilla. I said it earlier, right? So generally you're going to need the top products that people are asking for in any given market. And then you generally need a couple of products that are niche to your area, whether it's your target demographic or your geographical target area. So you need... United Healthcare, you probably need Aetna and you probably need Humana, most likely, right? Just about any given state in the union, those are going to be three of your top carriers. If you look at the, the, the business that is going in the Medicare space, I would say probably about 70, 75% of it, maybe even 80% of it is going through those three carriers. There'll be a few states that have exceptions, of course. But for the most part, on a national kind of footprint, 
Those three carriers get about 80% of the marketplace. After you get those three, then you got to look for a couple of products that are specific to your area. Are you in an area where Devoted is hot? Are you in an area where Blue Cross is hot or Anthem is hot or maybe uh, Providence or WellCare or whatever the product might be? Because there's a bunch of different products out there. And then when it comes to looking at Medicare supplement products, a lot of and, and certainly the products that I've already labeled, United Healthcare, Humana, Aetna, not only do they have Medicare Advantage products, but they also have Medicare supplement products. So you're immediately picking up both sides of the fence just in those three. And then beyond that, maybe get you a couple of rate warriors. Find you a product that just has the damn best rates in your state. Pick that one up if it's available to you. And then maybe look for a product that has a little extra underwriting wiggle room. It's a little more lenient than the other ones. When you got someone that has some ailments and you got to get them through underwriting, boom, you got that niche product. And that's your five. You don't need anything else to start with. Once you get your legs under you, then look for the gaps in your portfolio that you're like, okay, I need a good hospital indemnity product that I can plug in. I need a good cancer product. I need this other Medicare Advantage plan that I'd overlooked previously, but I, it's it's coming up more and more in my marketplace. You can always grow your portfolio, but you should never start, in my opinion, if you're brand new to the space with more than five and just uh, and, and learn to pick them. Right. If you need some help figuring out your Medicare portfolio, give me a holler. Uh, you know, there's plenty of quote engines out there that you as an agent can get a hold of. And you could look up the market, find out what's going on in any given area, see the data, see the analytics and go, oh, these are the products I need because they're the ones doing most of the business. So pretty simple. That is the show for today. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, it was a little bit of a hodgepodge of things that I just kind of wanted to talk about. I hope everybody is planning to have a fantastic Thanksgiving. Uh, I, I'm excited for you to start T65 soon too, Facebook user. So if I can help you, just give me a holler anytime. I'm here in the group. Look me up. But uh, Thanksgiving is right around the corner, man. I hope you guys have a great one. I am going to be traveling out of town for a couple of days. Uh, and I'll just tell you this right up front. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'm going to be off the grid, off the map. Don't call me. Don't look me up. I'm turning my phone off. And I'm just going to go out and work. We rented a uh, We rented a cabin somewhere out in the woods. I'm not even sure exactly where we did it. My sister rented it. So we have a cabin in the woods. Sounds like a horror movie already. And then we're all just going to go camp and they're glamping, I guess, in the cabin in the woods, have a little private Thanksgiving and just kind of chill and get off the, get off the radar for a little bit. So for the rest of this week after today, uh, you will not find me because I'm going to be in hiding and I might resurface sometime around Saturday. So other than that, man, you guys have an awesome, awesome Thanksgiving. Thank you for tuning in. And I'll see y'all next week for sure. Tuesday training. Have a great one.